Hi everyone, I'm Shane Jones, biology instructor at the College of Lake County. I'm Jason Cashmore, also a bio instructor for CLC. And Jason, what a beautiful day today. Yeah, it is a beautiful day, Shane, but I thought on this beautiful day we were going to go to the beach. Well, we are at the beach. This doesn't look like the beach to me. Well, it used to be a beach a few thousand years ago. Well, now the actual beach is down there, but today we're at the beach or what used to be the beach. And this area has, of course, changed a lot uh, over time since the last uh, glacial period. And so today we're going to be talking about uh, succession. And that's really the term for how places can change and landscapes change over time. So let's head down to the actual beach and take a look. All right, so now we're on the present day beach. And as Shane said, the uh, edge of the lake is not always here depending on climate. Uh, if it's a wetter, cooler climate, the lake is larger and the lake shore would be inland somewhere. If it's a warmer, drier climate, the lake gets smaller and the lake shore would be farther that way somewhere. Uh, and this is not something that happens, you know, in a short time period where the lake is going to get bigger or smaller, you'd be able to observe it. If you remember in the Bog Lab, Shane talked about geological time scales, things that happen over thousands of years or even tens of thousands of years or more. Um, so this is something that happens pretty slowly. Uh, but so it, it's not constant when we look around us at the landscape and we think, oh, it's always looked like this. It's always going to look like this. That's not true. Things are often in uh, a state of change, in a state of flux. Uh, so currently the lake is getting smaller. The lake shore is very slowly moving that way. And uh, so right here, we're at the current day beach. And you can see it's pretty exposed here. Uh, the waves are pounding the shoreline. Um, you know, if there's a lot of wind, we'd be getting hammered by wind here. Um, in the, the winter, ice can pile up here. Uh, so this is a very uh, tough environment. We don't really see a lot living or growing here. If we look up and down the beach, there really aren't any plants growing here. So we see the waves crashing onto shore here, part of why it's such a, a tough environment here. And one of the things that that can lead to is erosion. Now, if you look, there's this line of rocks in the water there. Those are not natural, that's called riprap. People put that there on purpose to slow down the waves and try to slow down the erosion of the beach from the water. But if you look behind me, you can see this kind of cliff of sand here that has been slowly eroding away. So in spite of the efforts to try to stop that here, uh, erosion is still happening. And certainly if the water level is higher, if there are storms, there's gonna be more erosion happening. And we'll talk more about erosion as we walk through the sand dunes. So in today's lab, we're, the, the main thing we're talking about is ecological succession. And there's different types of ecological succession. The type that is happening here at the sand dunes is primary ecological succession. In primary succession, you have areas of bare rock or sand that become exposed and then become colonized by living organisms, lichens, plants, eventually animals. And as the lake shore recedes and it exposes areas of rock and areas of sand, because there's no organic matter here, because it's just bare rock, bare sand, this would be primary succession. Species will start colonizing the site. The first species that show up are called the pioneer species. And they'll start making changes uh, to the ecosystem that allow later species to move in and replace them. So as we uh, walk up onto the first sand dune, we'll start to see some of those pioneer species. Let's go check them out. All right, so here we are now at the four dune. The lake is just behind me on the actual lake shore where Jason was a moment ago. It was just down below me a little ways. Uh, so around me now, you don't see as many you know, rocks like you did uh, at the beach, although there are still some remnants of those uh, here down fixed amongst uh, the sand. You can see you know, so, some pebbles and stones still there, but a lot of sandy material. Uh, where I'm standing right now used to be just like the beach where Jason was uh, talking about the lake receding just uh, a little while ago. Uh, so Lake Michigan and the other Great Lakes were formed by glacial activity as part of the last ice age. And as those glaciers receded, you know, those big depressions that they created filled with water. 
and the lake level was much higher uh, you know, if we go back thousands of years, as much as 60 feet higher than it is today. So at one point, this was the bottom of Lake Michigan. But as climate warmed, some of the water uh, evaporated, the lake filled in, etc. It's slowly moving back and was exposing new land. And so we had at the very beach a bunch of larger stones and cobbles. But as you saw with the waves, they'll crash, the rocks will mix with each other, grind against each other, and, and sort of turn them in, themselves into a, a powdery material we just call uh, sand. And so, you know, this area's been exposed a lot longer than the current beach is, so there's been a lot more time for that grinding and, and formation of sand to occur. And now we're at the point where there's enough uh, material where we can actually start to have some species growing. So, you know, right behind me, you can see some grasses. Now, this is still early spring, and they haven't started to really uh, grow or sprout back yet, but uh, there's, a, there's not too many species that can live out here. Uh, but the species that can, we would refer to broadly as pioneer species, kind of like the early settlers or pioneers uh, that uh, you know, moved west from the eastern uh, coast. And so there's very few nutrients uh, available. You know, sand, for one, does not hold water very well. If you pour water on it, it will quickly move through it. And two, it does, doesn't retain a lot of nutrients. So pioneer species like these grasses, like beach grass, sand reed, and lime grass, are adapted to living in very nutrient poor conditions and also uh, conditions that are fairly unstable. Now, there's still a lot of disturbance here, maybe not quite as much as there was on the beach shore, but still a lot of wind. Uh, there's obviously a lot of foot traffic around here too that can impact it. And so these are the very first species that are sort of colonizing in what Jason was talking about with primary succession. So we had you know, land exposed for the first time in the form of these bare rocks on the lake shore. They were solely kind of ground out into sand, uh, and now we have some actual species starting to, to move in. And they're going to set the stage for additional changes to take place, and then for more species to begin to arrive and settle, as we'll see as we move further back. All right, so let's go take a look at that. All right, so we've moved a little bit farther in from the foredune, although conditions are still pretty similar here. If you look at the sand right here, what you're going to notice is that it's really light in color. And the reason for that is it's basically just sand. There's not a lot of organic matter mixed into the sand. Organic matter is left over when uh, dead organisms decompose. So all of the plants that are growing here, every year they grow, they, parts of them die, they decompose, and that added, adds organic matter to the sand. Organic matter is basically like little sponges. If it rains, the organic matter holds on to some of that moisture, and that's available for the plants that are growing here. Well, here, uh, close to the foredune, there's very little organic matter in the sand, and so this is actually a really dry environment. And there's a couple of things that tell us that. One, we look at the sand, it's really light. Organic matter is very dark in color, so if there were more organic matter accumulated in the sand, we would see that it would be darker. And as we move farther away from the lake, through later successional stages, we'll show you that the sand is darker because there's more organic matter accumulated in it. The other thing that tells us how dry it is here is that we have really dry loving plants that grow in the sand dunes. This is a yucca plant. Yucca plants are also found in the desert. So uh, the conditions here really are very dry. In fact, just across the border, if you go south a little bit into Illinois, at Illinois Beach State Park, there are prickly pear cactus that are growing wild there. So students have a tendency to think, oh, well, there's a giant lake right there. There must be a lot of water. But because the substrate here is very sandy with very little organic matter, it's really, really dry. And so the plants that are growing on the fore dune and these dunes that are just behind it have to be tolerant of very dry conditions. The plants that are growing here play a really important role. If you look right behind me, there's kind of a, a small hill of sand right here. So the wind and the rain are gonna want to erode all of the sand back into the lake. But the plants that are growing here, their roots are holding the sand in place as organic matter accumulates. They help to hold that in place as well. And then the above ground parts of the plants act as something of a windbreak. If the wind does blow through here and some of this loose sand starts to blow into these plants, it's going to hit the stems and leaves and it's going to fall down. 
So not only does that prevent the erosion of the sand back into the lake, it helps these, these dunes, these piles of sand to build up over time. Now here on this side of the lake, we have dunes, you can see them, they're nice. If you've ever been on the east side of the lake in Michigan, the sand dunes there are 60 feet high. They're actually the tallest freshwater uh, sand dunes in the world. So we have really nice sand dunes, but if you ever get the chance, you might want to go check out the ones on the other side of the lake too. So let's keep heading inward and see what we find next. Where we're at now is an area a little bit further inland from where we just were looking at the, the four dune and the area where we saw the yucca. So the lake shore uh, was here at one point, but a lot more time has passed where this land has been exposed compared to where we were just a few uh, moments ago. And for that reason, a lot more time has passed and thus much many more seasons have passed. So the sand that we saw a little bit uh, closer to the lake was much lighter than it is here. Now it's still fairly light, but you can see, <clears throat> one, there's a lot more you know, plant material, but you can see it's a little bit uh, darker. Uh, it has a lot more organic material mixed into it. And so, because there's more organic material now in this uh, very sandy soil, it can retain a little bit more water and a few more nutrients than is possible further or closer to the lake. And so for that reason, we have some new additional species that are able to colonize this area that really wouldn't be able to exist uh, much closer to the lake because the conditions of the soil just are not quite good enough. You know, still a little bit too dry, still nutrient poor. Uh, for example, we have a uh, little blue stem here. This is a plant that we associate with our prairies native to this area, uh, but it can survive in very dry uh, and uh, you know, sort of low nutrient uh, conditions. And, and behind me, you can see kind of that, that raised you know, hill behind where was an old dune. I guess it still is a dune technically, but you don't really see much exposed sand anymore. It's very much coated in plant material. Uh, and again, as that plant material grows and dies and grows and dies year after year, we'll get more and more accumulation of that. And so here next to me, we have uh, a black oak tree. Uh, it's very young, so it's kind of right on the front lines, right at that transition area where there's maybe just enough water retention and nutrients that it can survive where it wouldn't be able to survive any place forward. But as time goes on, you know, this area will continue to accumulate more organic matter. Uh, the tree will grow taller and taller. And then the, the acorns that it produces, you know, when they fall out that direction, right now they're not going to be able to survive. But, you know, given many more years in the future, uh, they will be able to survive. And then this whole kind of line will continue to move closer to the lake as the lake continues to recede. And this isn't the only tree species that we'll find kind of right at this transition area as well. Uh, there's another species called uh, Eastern Cottonwood that we have in the area. So let's go take a look at those. So you just saw the black oaks with Shane. Another tree species that's pretty commonly found on the sand dunes is what's right behind me here, which is the Eastern Cottonwood. Now you're probably familiar with Eastern Cottonwood. As the name suggests, they have cotton that's connected to their seeds. So in late summer, when they release their seeds, uh, probably your window screens and maybe other things at your house might get coated in this cottony substance. It's the seeds from these trees. Now, these trees actually prefer fairly moist soil, but they're a generalist. Even though they prefer moist soil, they'll grow in just about anything, which is why we find them here at the sand dunes. It's very dry here, it's very nutrient poor, there's not a lot of organic uh, material in the sand, but eastern cottonwoods don't care. They can live just about anywhere, so we find them here along with the black oaks. Now you also might remember eastern cottonwoods because they were talked about in module 2.1, uh, which was looking at ecosystem ecology, and it was the case study of the Biosphere 2 project. If you remember, eastern cottonwoods were planted in one of the domes, and they learned something interesting about trees. When those trees got to a certain size, they literally fell apart because the wood of the tree couldn't support its own weight. So what they learned in that project is when trees are exposed to wind while they're growing, 
the wind blowing the tree around makes it form what's called stress wood and that actually provides strength for the tree the cottonwoods that were growing in the biosphere 2 dome there was no wind in there so they didn't develop that stress wood and once they got big enough they couldn't support their weight so uh, we're going to continue moving away from the lake and we'll see even more trees as we go All right, so now we're in an area that's even further inland from where we were before. And for that reason, it's been much longer since the lake shore was here. So as we've been discussing, you know, as the lake uh, recedes and continues to recede, uh, it's going to expose land and then we'll have, you know, species colonized. And so this area has had the longest time for colonization and change uh, over the thousands of years since this has been exposed. And we can get uh, evidence of that just by looking all around us. For one, we see a lot of fairly large trees, you know, much larger than the ones we saw uh, earlier. Because one, there's been a lot more time here for these trees to grow, but in addition to that, there's been a lot more time for the accumulation of organic matter uh, in the soil. So if I just go and expose some of the underlying surface here, it's quite thick and rich uh, and dark. And I really don't see much evidence of, of sand anymore, although you know, there are some very small grains in there, but it, it really doesn't look like the sand uh, at all. So this is going to hold moisture quite well. It will have a lot more you know, uh, nutrients in it than the sand would where we were at uh, further you know, back towards the, the lake shore. And so this area also has the highest diversity of any of the areas that we looked at before. So we talked about our pioneer species around the foredune, and there aren't too many things that will live out there all the time. So we have those plant species, and there may be some intermittent, you know, other uh, animals and things of that nature that may come, you know, in and out of there throughout the day. But overall, the, the cumulative diversity of species is going to be higher here because it's a more stable environment. It's not going to fluctuate or change quite as much as the blowing sand uh, would or maybe temperature extremes with, uh, with uh, sunlight where uh, there's really no shade. Here there can be little micro habitats and things which can provide many more places for a uh, much higher diversity of species. And this area will continue to change. Even though you know, we, it looks kind of like a forest right now, it's really not done quite yet. So these uh, black oaks that we're seeing around us, you'll know, like these drier conditions, but as more and more time goes by in the thickness of the the soil here accumulates even more, we'll start to have other tree species and other plant species that can start to arrive. And ultimately, given enough time, you know, this will transition into what we call our climax community. And for this area, that's going to be an oak hickory forest. And that's sort of the community that there's not going to be another stage uh, past that. Unless, of course, you have some kind of disturbance which sets it back. So let's talk a little bit about that now. So up to this point, we've been talking about primary succession. And primary succession is the natural changes that will occur over time starting from bare ground. So at the beach, uh, we had more or less bare rock. It was a bunch of cobbles, uh, some boulders, you know, gravel, those kinds of things, but no soil, nothing there really for, for plants to grow in. So we're basically starting from scratch. The same would have been true in the areas after the glacier receded, uh, where there was just nothing but uh, gravel and cobbles left behind there. Or if you think about you know, the Hawaiian Islands, when volcanoes uh, erupt and we have lava flows and then that lava uh, hardens into rock, you'll have, you know, basically bare rock there that then species can begin to colonize. And then from that, uh, with our pioneer species, we'll kind of set the stage for you know, numerous changes into different types of ecosystems after that. But occasionally ecosystems may be disturbed and sort of set back it to an earlier stage. And this is sort of a small example of that right here. What we have is a, is, a, is a bit of a blowout where you can see behind me an area that has been sort of lost or kind of caved in from a lot of foot traffic. In a natural areas like this, it's really essential that we try to stick to the trails and, and be conscious of any kind of damage that we might be doing to the, the negative uh, habitats and, and species. So now you can see, you know, bare exposed sand, which is evidence that, you know, the lake was here, that dunes were here, in fact. Uh, but now we're back in this area that's kind of our black oak community, right in this spot, we're basically back to where we are at the fore dune, where there aren't too many species that are going to live right in this spot. Now, if, if people stop walking through this area, 
Uh, it eventually will go through succession and then end up back as a, as a part of this uh, Black Oak community. And you may never even uh, notice uh, that this was here or know that this was here. And so that kind of uh, transition where we get some kind of disturbance and then it goes back to our stages of succession is called secondary succession. And so some other examples of secondary succession can include things like regrowth of a forest after a major forest fire. You know, out west there have been you know, numerous major uh, forest fires that have you know, scoured huge numbers of acres. And uh, those forests are sort of set back, although they're not starting from bare rock or bare ground. So there's still soil there. So even within one year after that fire is gone, the trees may have been pretty much decimated or wiped out. Uh, but you will start to have plants grow back almost immediately. And eventually, given enough time, it can become uh, those forests once again. Uh, and in addition, if you have you know, farm fields where you know, a farmer has been farming land for, for many generations uh, and then finally decides, you know, I, I'm done with farming, I want to you know, give the land back and kind of let the land go follow, you know, there is uh, soil there. Now, it would have likely been you know, a forest or a prairie long before it was ever a farm. So it was converted into a farm, and then if that land is left to kind of go back to nature, so to speak, it will then go through stages of succession, ultimately leading back to our climax community of uh, Oak Hickory Forest. So those are some examples of secondary succession. So we have primary succession, where we're starting from bare ground, and then going through these various stages, reaching our climax community. And at any point along that succession, if you have some kind of disturbance that sets it back, it can begin again and that's our secondary succession. So Shane has talked about uh, primary succession, secondary succession, both forms of ecological succession that happen in terrestrial areas where you've got land. But ecological succession also happens in aquatic environments. So behind me here is a wetland. This is essentially a big marsh. You can see there's a lot of cattails. Uh, there's a small area of open water back there. It's really common to find wetlands in uh, sand dune areas in low-lying areas in between the dunes. You won't necessarily find it in all sand dunes, uh, but obviously we see one here. We see these at Illinois Beach State Park in between the sand dunes as well. And it's very possible at one point that this entire marsh was open water. It may have started out as a pond. And then what happens as aquatic life colonizes the pond, it lives, it grows, it dies, and decomposes, it turns into organic material, just like we've been talking about in the sand dunes. But in water, the organic material sinks down to the bottom, and then it slowly accumulates on the bottom, the bottom gets built up, and that pond or lake or whatever the body of water is, gets shallower and shallower over time. As the organic matter accumulates, it's also adding nutrients, which means more plants are growing in it, which speeds up that accumulation of organic matter. Eventually, a lake or a pond would turn into a marsh like this. Now we can see there's a lot of plants growing out here. The organic matter is going to continue to accumulate, and as it builds up, eventually it'll raise above the level of the water, this will become a more dry habitat and it might turn into, you know, an oak forest or an oak hickory forest, like Shane was talking about a little bit ago as the climax community for our area. So what do you say, Jason? Do you enjoy your day at the beach? Shane, I am loving it here. I just wish I had been here 5,000 years ago to really enjoy the beach right here at this spot. I hear you. And I hope you, like Jason, learned something today and that Eventually you get uh, some time out and you can come see areas like this, Illinois Beach State Park or where we're at today in Kenosha Dunes. There's a lot more to see than just the beach. So get out, explore, and enjoy. Remember, stay on the trails.